Well, hello everyone. This is Jason Cisco, and we are live at the Church Triumphant here at our main campus, 1030 Strawberry Road. It's good to be back in my office and back in connection with you. This has been a travel day today, so we had to uh, move our broadcast time to this evening. We know it's not the normal time uh, when we broadcast. We uh, used to do an evening broadcast when COVID first began, but as we uh, kind of progressed, we really felt impressed to go to noon, and then it just became uh, something else. There was a, a new anointing that kind of touched it, and I think because so many different time zones could connect in with us, uh, so many different places. It seemed to be a good time for them. And also the prophetic significance of high noon. And so we realized that if people are connecting in Hawaii or they might be connecting in Germany or they might be connecting in uh, Malaysia or South America or Central America or South Africa or wherever. And so it's a different time zone. But we kind of take high noon as our prophetic signal of, of being in all the light that there is. And that became uh, sort of the identity of this time of prayer. So even though it's seven o'clock, we welcome you uh, to our prayer broadcast tonight. And thank you uh, for just connecting with us. And uh, I know it's different for you and it's different for us, but I really wanted to share with you, we, we love to be consistent. It's it, There's something amazing about hitting it every single day and knowing that there are people that are praying every single day. And so we just want to share the love of God with you. We want to share hope for our future, and we want to release faith. This is something that God has spoken to us for the church triumphant as a community. And for us as lead uh, pastors, my wife and I, we stand with the word of God and saying that I believe what God says. I believe his word, and that trumps everything else. And through his word, faith is imparted to us. But we had a word last year before all of this happened that God said, that the gift of faith was going to become resident within our church. And so this is a, a gift that is operating. And every time we get online, you just never know what's going to happen. So I'm seeing many, many joining us. Hello. It's great to see you. God bless you. Thank you so much for being a part of our broadcast tonight. I don't know what our final number is going to be tonight, but we're just going to share what God has given to us, and I'm glad that you are here. For all the church triumphant faithful that are connecting with us, God is going to activate you. We have people praying here in, their, in our building tonight. We're obviously being careful because of uh, the outbreak that's going on here in Houston uh, and the surrounding areas. We're wearing our mask and we're social distancing, but we are uh, trying to do small groups as, a, as something that we can do. So what we can do, we will do. And uh, I'm seeing New Jersey join us. God bless you. Atlanta, Georgia uh, jumping in. God bless you. There's DeKalb, uh, Illinois. How wonderful. Thank you so much. There's but a Shannon Rock again just joining in. Indiana joining in. So, so many. God bless you. Thank you so, so much for uh, joining in with us. So uh, tonight we are going to uh, just connect in with the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter number 42. Here is a really key uh, portion of scripture that's going to tie us into what we've just been talking uh, talking about. California joining in. God bless you. Uh, uh, I, I saw Arizona jumping in. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, well, I, if I do that, that's all we'll do tonight. But thank you so much for everybody. Let's lift our hands. Let's lift our voices. And let's invite God into this time of just connecting tonight. Father, thank you for your people, the amazing people of God all around the world all around the United States, and especially here, oh God, those who call Church Trump at their church home. We thank you, Father, for the privilege to lead and the privilege to pray and the privilege to share in the hope that we all have, that in this life we have faith and your Holy Spirit is the earnest of our inheritance. But ultimately, God, we have a hope beyond this world. And so we thank you that we can connect with you in your throne room. We can connect with our heavenly father. And we can say, our father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And we thank you for daily meeting our needs. We thank you for forgiving us. And thank you, Lord, for helping us to forgive. Thank you for delivering us from temptation and from the evil one. And we thank you most importantly, God, that yours is the kingdom and yours is the power 
And so you get all the glory. We pray right now in Jesus' name that you would just refresh our minds after a long day today. Help us to be renewed. Help us to be calibrated and clarified. And as we come to the time of the evening sacrifice tonight, so Lord, we bring our bodies as a living sacrifice to you. And we want to just reset ourselves as we ponder our day and as we prepare for tomorrow. In Jesus' name. Everybody say, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Okay, yesterday I was talking to you about David and how David was prophetic and he began to invest in his future. And I talked to you about how there were these little cities that he connected in and that he stopped uh, just trying to hide in Ziklag. Ziklag had been burned down. He knew then it would just be a temporary place until God spoke to him. And while he was waiting for that next season to kind of unfold in front of him, something amazing began to happen. God began to activate gifts in him and ideas in him, creative thought processes. And his men began to say, well, let's go over here to South Judah. And let's go over here to the people of, of Rachel's background. And let's go over here to this city. Let's go. And they ended up in Hebron. And from Hebron there, God would ultimately anoint him to be king. And that would be the beginning of a new era for Israel. Ultimately, he would be king in Jerusalem. And so I talked about how every victory releases a victory, that there's something prophetic inside of every victory. Just like a piece of fruit has a seed in it, it has future trees inside of every piece of fruit. So there is something in the spirit that happens when we receive a victory from God. So if we can win in our desert, if we can win in our wilderness, then God will help us to move forward into our future. And we don't know how big this is right now. We know how massive the attack is. And as I've been saying all through this pandemic, the degree of our resistance is directly tied to the degree of our potential. If there is a global pandemic going on, then that must mean that hell is trying to stop a global revival, a global visitation from God. So oftentimes what we experience in real time here prophetically has already been seen. It's already been accounted for. God already has a plan in place. And Satan is counteracting a plan that he's already seeing God acting on. And now we see the reaction of hell, but we don't even know how much hell has already heard what God has said. So in 1 Peter 1 and 12, it tells us that the angels desire to look into the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. And so that means that the spirit world studies what God does with the church because this is where God reveals his wisdom. This is where God shows his plans. This is where the strategies are executed. And this is where the prophetic is released. And so as we speak the prophetic, that's when the demonic world will listen in just like the angels are observing. And so fallen angels uh, as well as the angels that are in the kingdom of God or with the kingdom of God. They are all around God's working through his church because this is the outlet. This is the, the way the manifold wisdom of God is shown to principalities and powers. It's through the church. And so the prophetic is God's insight into the future. Satan is a planner. He does not know the future, but he's a planner. So he plans out what he wants and gets as many people as possible to work the plan with him until his plan will come to pass. That's what he's looking for. So tonight, we have the opportunity to connect with God and to connect in the prophetic dimension and to show what the spirit world, uh, what the spirit world wants to know. But we get to know it through the spirit because Satan cannot have any more wisdom. He's as wise as he'll ever be. But you and I, we can lift up our hands and if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. And so the spirit world knows this. So they study man and they listen to what man is, is saying and they listen to the conversations with heaven. And so as, as God and man are, are communicating, the spirit world is listening in and watching and they're paying attention because the prophetic gives, gives hints of what God's next steps are. Now, this is why sometimes God conceals things, why some things remain a, uh, as uh, the reason why God God sometimes um, re uh, holds things back or holds them as a mystery. And the reason is, is because he's not going to show it until it's time. 
He does not going to get too far ahead because the spirit, the, 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 the spirit of the world and the Antichrist system in the world may try to stop it. So we are just able to stand in the spirit and wait as God reveals it because when he does reveal it, something amazing then begins to happen. Is that that means that God has already seen all of the steps through to the other side. The plan is already in step. It's already there in Jesus' name. So I want us to stop right now. I want to thank him for his voice and for his word and that he's going to tell us what we need to know when we need to know it. And that there might be mysteries for a season, but then when he opens it up, we know that that means that it's already secure. The plan has already been tested by God himself and he knows every aspect. He knows everything that he will do. Father, we thank you for your word that there are some days that we walk completely by faith and not by sight. That we do not see clearly what, what is coming in front of us. And then the prophetic will begin to open because of our faith. And you'll begin to give us more patterns and more understanding. And we begin to see in the spirit. And we begin to grasp our next steps. We may not see the totality of the plan. But we see as much as you need us to see in this moment. And that gives us the strength to keep carrying on. So in Jesus name, we thank you for it. Now, this is what David did. He operated out of the flow of the prophetic that had been hovering over him for generations. Now, I want to go back to that root. I want to go back to that foundation today, and I want to show you how the genetics of Judah give us answers for crisis situations. David was able to pull from the history that he had, and that helped it to be something that he pushed off of and then reached up into the future and let the future pull him into that next dimension. And so this is what we do. We have the word of the Lord and it pulls us into our future. But then we also push off from the prophetic uh, generations before us, from those that have already walked through many things. This is why we go to the book of Hebrews 12, where it says uh, that, that we are compassed about with a great cloud of witnesses. Those great cloud of witnesses are people saying, hey, I've already been there. I've already done that. Hey, I already conquered. Hey, I was already faithful all the way to the end. And so are you thankful that there's many that have already gone before us, that have already endured many things? I remember that I remember when COVID first happened, there was a there was a picture that was being circulated from a hundred years ago when Spanish flu came and they showed it on the bull on the bulletin board of the church or the outside um kiosk of the church and it said closed due to Spanish flu and everybody everybody passed that picture around the church has been through something like this before they had to shut down because of a pandemic before the church survived and somehow thrived and here we are a hundred years later and we're in a better place than they were then a hundred years ago so folks we, we reach into that that history and we say okay what did they do and then God then helps us to use it as a launch pad and as a pattern to give us the specific insights that relate to us and then we pass that forward what we learn in the spirit now there are some things that we're going to do now that other generations have not learned they have not but we take what we can and we apply it that is the value of the word of God is the spirit of God can keep taking us back and we can keep gleaning in incredible insights from generations before us because the word of God is eternal and he knows how to make it apply to our situation right now. Now just a refresh, what is the Rima word of God? Faith comes by what? It comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So many times people say, well, when I read the Bible, that's when my faith comes. Well, that that's true. It does help our faith. But this is not the word here. It's not logos. It's not written word. When it says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, it means rhema word. The, the rhema word is God speaking a written word to you to apply to your situation. That's right. Uh, Romans 10, 17. Thank you for putting that reference up. And so what does that mean? That means that, that there is a specific scripture that applies a specific concept, and we get this every day. God has things from his word that he gives to us every single day as we're listening to God. So the spirit begins to speak to us and enlightens us. So let's look at this now. Let's look at Genesis 42. So David went through a wilderness, 
and he leaned back upon his, uh, leaned back upon something in his genetics, victories that had already been won in his genetics, and the prophetic word that hovered over him, that the scepter would not depart from Judah, neither a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. David is the beginning of that prophetic word. But when you go to Genesis 42, we see how Judah attained into that dimension of the prophetic how Judah attained into that kingly anointing, what it was that unlocked that, that power of God so that the patriarch, before he would die, would give that blessing to Judah. What, what did he do? How did this happen? And so right at the birthing point, that becomes a fountainhead. You go back to the, to the beginning of the river sometimes to get, to get insights about the entirety of the river. Where did the river start from? That's why Jesus took them back to Caesarea Philippi. And at Caesarea Philippi, he said, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? Why is he taking them back to Caesarea Philippi? That's the mouth of the Jordan River. The river comes right out of that mountain and begins to flow there. He's taking them back to the source. And he is saying, have you figured out who I am yet? Do you know who I am yet? And he says, what, what is it? What, what does he say? Ah, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Praise God. So we go to Genesis chapter number 42. And this is where something happens here. They go to Egypt. And they're, they're getting corn in Egypt. And that's all the direction the patriarch can give him. Jacob calls his sons together. And he says, I've heard there's corn in Egypt. This was new for them. They were used to Jacob, the man who wrestled with God, whose name was changed to Israel. They were used to Jacob, the man who laid his head on a rock and saw angels come up and come down and had access to the gate of heaven. Uh, they, they were used to, to Jacob always hearing from God, always walking in favor. And now for the first time, he just simply says, I've heard there's corn in Egypt. No inspiration, no word from the Lord. Just I've been listening to the fellow travelers coming by. So go to Egypt. And what he's doing is he is saying, it's time for this generation to step up. I've held your hand long enough. It's time for you to learn how to hear from God, how to trust God. You're going to have to go on this journey. And so when they come back, they empty out their sacks. Their money is in their sacks. And Simeon is not with them. And so now they have to tell them about this man that they met and, and how he accused them of being spies and and their dad is, is very upset. And he said, look, they told us that we can't come back. He told us, that man told us. Egypt told us we can't come back without Benjamin. And so now there is trust that's breaking down. It's huge. And Jacob says in verse 36 of Genesis 42, And Jacob their father said unto them, Me have ye bereaved of my children. Joseph is not. He went on a trip and didn't come back. Now you went on a trip as 10 brethren and you're coming back and Simeon is not. Every time you go away, I lose something. And he says, now you're going to take Benjamin away. All these things are against me. Jacob has, has, has succumbed to the moment. He has succumbed to the hour. He has, he has broken down under the weight of the pressure. This is what would later be called Jacob's trouble. It is a season of time when his own children are growing and trying to mature and they make lots of mistakes and there's lots of failure. And here's Joseph and he's the firstborn of Rachel and that was his uh, first love. And so he says, Joseph's going to be the leader of the family. But there's all these other older brothers that resent that because they've already been doing all the work. You can see at this point that Reuben is about 40 years old when Joseph is sold into slavery at 17. So these men had already been in the fields and they resented it. Now, during the famine, everything is becoming level. Everyone is just trying to survive. There's something about a season of crisis. When there's a global crisis, when there's a global shutdown, when there's a global famine, uh, when you see, you know, in our case, it is, it is fabricated as a result of a, uh, of a disease, of a COVID-19 but you see all of the ramifications happening to finances and people shutting down all around the world. You see how it levels us all out and we just start saying, hey, we just want to survive. We just want to get through this. And so 
uh, Jacob says, everything is against me. It's very easy for us to look at all the losses. It's very easy for us to see things just through this one lens. So I want you to notice, Reuben's the oldest, and so he's trying to take the lead here, and he says, slay my two sons if I bring Benjamin not back to thee. Deliver him into my hand, and I will bring him back to thee again. And he said, my son will not go down with you. For his brother is dead, and he is left alone. And if mischief befall him by the way, then you will bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. He says, I'm not going to trust you, Benjamin. I'm not going to trust Benjamin with you, uh, Reuben. I am not going to trust you, Reuben. And notice, it's because Reuben's mentality is wrong. Think about this from the patriarch's perspective. Reuben, said, Reuben says, I've got two sons. I will kill my sons if something happens to Benjamin. And Jacob says, those are my grandsons. So you're telling me that if something happens to my son, that you're going to swear to me that you're going to kill my grandsons? He said, my son is not going down to Egypt with you. What he was trying to do, what he was trying to say was I'm willing to sacrifice my kids for you. I'm going to try to show you my degree of commitment by saying I'm willing to kill for you. And, and this was not the right mindset. Oftentimes when we're trying to show loyalty, we say I'll damage somebody else to show you how committed I am to you. This is, this is a mentality that sometimes shows up during extreme times is that in order to right another wrong, we go do more wrong. In order to overcome the hurt done to someone else, we go and hurt someone else. And we show how loyal we are and how angry we are about what happened to somebody else by saying, I'll kill for you to show you how loyal I am to you. And, and, and the patriarch says, no, this is not the right mindset. I do not trust someone that would kill to show me their loyalty. That might be in the mafia, but that's not what we do uh, in the church. That might be uh, maybe in the gangs, <laughs> but that's not what we do in the church. We don't kill to show our loyalty. And so he says, I, I don't have any trust. I don't have any trust. So the, the verse, verse 1 of 43, Genesis 43, and the famine was sore in the land. Things got worse. Time passed, and the Bible says they had eaten up all the corn which they had gotten out of Egypt. And their father said, hey, go and buy us some more food. Hey, we need food. We're hungry. And now Reuben's not on the scene. Reuben doesn't try. Verse 3, why Judah? There was something that happened in Judah. There was a divine spark that happened in the mind and the heart of Judah. Something opened up before he knew his, his future would be blessed. Before Judah knew that out of his bloodline would come the Messiah. Before he knew that David would somewhere be uh, in his genealogies. Judah says, wait a minute. I think we can approach this from a different perspective. If we are going to get out of this famine, we have to change the way we think. Now, let me show you in the spirit what's happening. Let me just lay this out for you. So when they rejected Joseph, they rejected the prophetic. When his family did not believe in his dreams and they stripped him of his robe, they sent him as a slave to Egypt, what happened? Joseph then becomes prophetic. He experiences everything that the world is about to face in a global famine before they experience it. What God does is oftentimes he cannot move the whole of the church or the whole of a movement. He cannot get everyone there fast enough. He can't get us all on the same page fast enough. So there are certain people that get prophetic words. They get dreams. They get visions. They become innovators. They become leaders. And what happens is they get rejected. When everything is calm and everything is fine and it's business as usual, they kind of stick out. They don't fit. They're a little bit awkward. And they're coming out and they're saying, hey, I had a dream the other night. And I saw the sun and the moon and the stars and they were all bowing down to me. You know what? God's trying to show me something. I think it's awesome. And, and, and we all go, what are you talking about, you idiot? 
We're all going to bow down to you. You know, go, go play with your toys. We're trying to do some real work around here. And, and they, just, they just resented him. Even his parents said, Joseph, are we all going to bow down to you? They, they, he didn't know how to talk about what was happening to him. He was saying, I'm experiencing the prophetic. I, I'm tying into stuff. I don't know what to do. I just, I just want to share what's happening to me. And so they reject him. Oftentimes, rejection is the very thing that God uses to release the will of God into your life. If he gets embraced in a Bedouin culture, he never rises above the ceiling of the patriarch and the, and, and the mentality that governs all of them. He gets rejected. Now he gets put in an entirely different environment and he has no ceiling. God is his ceiling. So oftentimes, the prophetic will put you in a position where you are where you are rejected and then from that pain and from that loss you actually experience the prophetic you live the prophetic even before you even understand what it is that you're living through so when you come out on the other side of it god has given you revelation god has given you understanding and somehow favor negotiated him to to potiphar's house Favor saved him from a manipulating woman that tried to destroy his morals. Favor saved him in a prison until ultimately he interpreted a dream and then puts him on the stage of the world and he tells Pharaoh, this is what God is saying to you. And all of a sudden, bam, the dream is one. The dream that he had at 17 is now coming to pass at age 30 and it all comes in 15 minutes, he went from being forgotten in a prison to shave a good shower and a new robe and standing before the greatest leader of the world. I'm going to tell you, God knows how to create a prophetic stage when he wants to. You think you're lost in obscurity. You think you're stuck in a prison. You think nobody knows about you. You just keep walking in that favor. You don't get bitter. You just keep here and you feel all alone and isolated. No, no, no. It's God letting you prophetically experience what everybody else is going through in real time before they ever experience it. You already went through it. You're already on the, on the other side and you got the keys to the storehouse. So the reason, the reason why he tests his brothers when they come to him. He knows his brothers, but they can't recognize him. He looks Egyptian. He may have had, the, he may have had a strange haircut. He may have had uh, eye markings on. He probably uh, wore the royal regalia of the Egyptians. He obviously spoke Egyptian. He uses a translator, but he understands Hebrew. They couldn't recognize him. Oftentimes when we see the future that has been told to us, we do not recognize it. It never looks like we expect. Revival will never look like we thought it was going to look. When God fulfills the, the destiny that is in over our lives, it never looks like we think. And so they couldn't recognize it, but he could recognize them. And what he was testing them on is, have you grown? Are you mature? And can you handle the stage? Can you handle the stage? Because right now, I'm the voice of God to the world. He was called Zaphnaphpania. God lives and he speaks. That's what they called him in Egypt. God lives and he speaks. And so he's saying, the world is looking at me as a representation of God's voice. I am here. I am here as someone who interpreted the dream. I have given a plan and a strategy from God that is literally saving Egypt. And as a result, we have enough corn to save the world. And you're here today getting the corn because of what God did in my life. And I want to know, do you have what it takes to be on this stage with me? And so there has to be a point of testing to see if the rest of the movement can catch up with those prophetic people. So God has prophetic people that he positions. And I'm telling you, you may not know them, but they exist right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. I remember when I was first getting involved in the, in the prophetic as a young minister, and I was getting mentored by people like Lee Stone King and, and Billy Cole and T.W. Barnes, and of course my dad and others that I was around. There was a, a many group, uh, many group, and many people in the group that were, that were using the gifts of the Spirit. And 
And so I was kind of in there. A lot of of my peers were getting involved with it. And so we were all just reaching out and praying and and just intensely. Every day we were in the Spirit. Every day was ours in the Spirit. And and I began to really uh, be separate from my my friends that I grew up with, the people I went to school with. It was really getting more and more awkward because they weren't going where I was going. And so I remember sitting one night in a pizza hut and some of the basketball players, I, we won two uh, national championships in, in, in our Christian school. And so we were kind of going out to celebrate and going to pizza hut and we're sitting there and, and I'm sitting there and all of a sudden the jukebox comes on and man, they were just, it was, they were literally standing on the chairs. They were jumping on the tables and it was like, I was like, um, that's not what I'm about, you know, I'm not going to condemn anybody or criticize anybody, but I am not going to get out and do what you're doing right now because it, 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 it was not really, it was not really a good behavior. And so uh, they all just sort of felt it and sensed it. And they never asked me to go back out and eat anymore. It, things like that started happening because, you know, I, I was already setting my course. I was already traveling. I was already preaching. I was already, and I was just trying to connect with my friends and it just, it was awkward. It didn't fit. I remember praying and feeling like I was all alone. And then one day, God showed me. He showed me. He took me somewhere over to Europe. And it was a neat, small little room. And I saw this man who was quite a bit older than me. He was dressed in very plain clothes, but they were all perfectly pressed. He had a very close uh, haircut. He was a little bit balding. His bed was was perfectly uh, 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 made. And everything was in order. And then I saw him get down to pray. And as when I heard that man pray, oh my goodness, I, I began to be jealous. I thought, man, he can pray like I, I, I don't know how to pray like that. And then, and then I saw God coming and Jesus coming into the room. And I saw Jesus come and stand there. And he turned and looked at me and he said, this is one of my friends. And he said, I have a lot of friends like this around the world and you don't know who they are. He said, but I know who they are. You are not alone. And he said, he said, but the point is coming. He said, many who are operating in this dimension feel as if they are all alone, but I am showing you many of these men now. I'm going to show you this whole community of people. And he said, and I'm going to help you bring them together. You're going to work together with many. We will not always be alone. But there is a time in our lives when we feel as if we're the only one. And it's because we got rejected. But rejection is always the first step to launch us into that place that God wants us to be. Because I have to bring you to somewhere. And I can't bring you to someplace if I've never been there. If I've never suffered, I can't teach you about suffering. If I've never lost anything, I can't help you through your loss. If I've never been rejected, I can't help you with your emotions. If everything has been perfect in my life, all of my life, then I really can't relate. But God wants me to be able to say, yes, I've been there and 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 I know a little bit about that. And so I can be able to speak. So he trusts us with some suffering so that he can teach us his word and he can show us the message that he wants us to be able to share with the world. And so here's Joseph. He's on the other side now. He's got the keys. He is operating in a dimension of glory while the rest of the world is in famine. And here his his father is saying, go buy us a little more food. Go back to Egypt. Nothing is happening here. Nothing is happening in Canaan land. And and they're all still still somewhat perplexed by this. God, why aren't you blessing us where we are? Because God is saying, I'm ready to move all of you into a new place. And this is what God is saying right now, is that I'm not going to bless where you were. I'm going to bless where you're going. Woo, can you feel that right now? I've, I've given a lot of layers to you uh, right now. I want you to stop right now. Can you just lift your hands and can you thank the Lord right now? Let's process a little bit about what the Lord has been speaking to us tonight. Father, we just thank you in the name of Jesus. We thank you for the power of your spirit. We thank you for all the ways that you've postured us, all the ways that you've brought us through trials. All these things that we've been through were, 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 were just trial runs for us personally to be able to relate to what others may go through during a season. Of, of great intense extremes. But Lord, there's going to be people that are strategically planted, spe- 
strategically positioned next to great men, next to people with resources, next to people with power, next to lawmakers, next to businessmen, next to educators. Father, I thank you that you are positioning prophetic people all around the world in high places. As you positioned Paul, as you positioned Mordecai and Daniel, oh God, as you positioned Joseph, Father, I thank you that you are positioning people right now in in Jesus' name, I want you to clap your hands to the Lord and give him praise. Now, folks, at some point, at some point, Jacob and his family has to connect with the prophetic word that is fulfilled through their brother and his son, Joseph. God does not want this distance to stay, to stay, th to stay this way forever. It's for a season of time to test them and to prove them and to bring them into maturity. We don't know how long this pandemic and this season of waiting is, but God is testing us. This is a season of testing. This is a time to see who's mature, who's adjusted their attitude, who's changed their mentality. Reuben stepping up, I'll kill for you. No, that's not the right mentality. You don't get to lead. But who's going to lead? Judah is going to lead because he is a prophetic connector. Someone has to connect where Jacob and his family is with Joseph and, Israel, and Egypt. He's, someone has to be the bridge. Someone has to close the gap. Someone has to be the leader that, that leads the people and navigates them out of how they've been thinking, how they've been operating, and how God wants them to operate. Are you understanding? Are you tracking what I'm saying tonight? Whew, my God, I feel the Holy Ghost. Do you feel the Holy Ghost right now? <laughs> Oh, give him praise again. Just clap your hands to the Lord. Clap your hands to the Lord right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, now, this is what Judah says. He, he talks to his father, and he says, The man did solemnly protest against us, saying, You shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. Now, this was the test. I'm not going to Egypt without my brother. It's not going to be every man for himself. It's going to be, I'm not going without my brother. This is the prerequisite for the church to move out of the pandemic and to move out of the crisis. Is It has to be this mentality that says we all go. Everybody is making this move. Everybody is going to be a part of this. Everybody is going to do this. It's all going to happen. I'm not going without you. I'm not going without you. There's some people that are already anchored in the future. They're the prophetic beacons that have already heard from God and given us a message and given us a dream. But there has to be someone that leads us to the glory, leads us to the future, leads us to revival. And as we go, the prerequisite is the mentality has to shift. And this is what Judah, this is what Judah says. Look, we can't go without our brother. This is how it has to happen. He said, if you will not send him, we will not go down. I'm not going to get corn, dad. I'm not going to fake it. I'm not going to pretend that I didn't hear what he told us. We can't get up there and, sh and show up in front of that man without our brother. He won't give us any corn. He said, dad, this is the way it is. This is the law of survival is that if we survive this and we come out of this, we have to do it together. And you're going to have to trust us with Benjamin. Now, he gives him the reason to restore trust. In other words, in order for us to go into the next level, folks, we have to have an extraordinary amount of trust in each other. If you're going to start a house church, I'm going to have to trust you. If you're going to teach a Bible study, I'm going to have to trust you when you teach that Bible study. If you're going to be online and you're going to give a prayer uh, a session and you're going to lead a team uh, in prayer, I'm going to have to trust you. If, if you're going to speak on behalf of the church, I need to know that, that you're going to have the same heart, that you're going to have the same mind. If you're going to be in front of the camera and the world's going to watch, see, this is what Joseph was saying. Look, the whole world, the whole world is watching. Everybody is watching what I do, and I have a reputation now, not my reputation. 
I am upholding the reputation of God. And I got to know that my brothers are mature. And so Judah has somehow in the spirit intuitively picked that up. And he says, I got it. I got it. I understand what this is about. I see it. And so what does he say? He said, Israel said, wherefore dealt you so ill with me as to tell the man that you had a brother? And he said, the man asked us. We didn't tell him. He asked us. And so verse number eight, Judah says unto Israel, send the lad. Judah says to Israel, his father, send the lad with me. Now I want you to notice the text here. It goes from Jacob and now the Bible says, it, he, changed, he changes the language from referring to the patriarch as Jacob. And now in verse 8, and Judah said to Israel. That means that Judah's mentality when he talked to his dad was he was speaking to the best in his father. And he was saying, I know you're tired. I know you're hungry. I know you're exhausted. I know you've lost a lot. I know we failed you, but I'm telling you something has changed. And I want to speak to Israel, not to Jacob right now. And I want to tell you, you can send the lad with me. And here's why. That we may live and not die. This was the last time that Jacob had a prophetic word. He said, go to Egypt that we may live and not die. That was the last directive that he could give them. And Judah latched on to the last, the last word of faith. And he said, you said we were going to live and not die. And so I'm telling you, Father, you're going to release the lad to me. And the prophetic word that you, prof that you spoke over this whole family, you know what he says? We're going to live and not die, both we and thou and also our little ones. He says, now, I'm going to show you why. I will be surety for him. It is a big difference between saying I'll kill for someone and I'll die for someone. It is a huge difference to say I'm willing to hurt somebody else to show you my loyalty. Oh, no, 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 no. He says, I'm willing to be hurt. They'll have to get through me to get to Benjamin. I will be surety for him. You can take my life if something happens to him. Wow. I will bear the blame. I will be responsible for my brother. Now, what did John tell us? That this is how you know you have the love of the brethren and that you're willing to lay down your life for them. It's one thing for us to say, I'll die for God. It's something else to say, I'm willing to die for my brother. When the church is willing to love each other enough that we'll say, no, no, I'll take the bullet for him. I'll get in front of him. No, 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 no. You have to get through me to get to my brother. When we have this kind of a mentality and attitude, we are unstoppable. We will repair the breach. We will heal the wound and we will forever break all of the bitterness of the past. I want you to stop right now and I want you to thank the Lord that God is doing something in this season to create a love for one another, a bond that we share for each other, a bond that we share for the church, for the family of God, for the people of God, like we've never had before. Father, I want to say thank you for the amazing people, the amazing people of God. I want to say thank you. Thank you for those that have loved me, those that have stood by me, those that have been brothers to me, those that have been sisters to me. Thank you, God, for all, all of, the, uh, of the elders that have poured into my life. Thank you for all the, all the mothers that mothered me when I was a young preacher. Thank you, God, for all the pastors and pastors' wives, for all the homes that I stayed in, for all the people that I've learned to love and know and that I've connected with and that I trust with my very life. Help me now to be trustworthy, Father. Help me, oh God, to be willing to be responsible. Help me, oh God, to love people the way you love people. Thank you for it, Lord. Thank you for it, Lord. Thank you for it. This is the heart. This was the heart of Jacob. This was the heart of Jacob. And when Judah tapped into the heart of that patriarch, something unlocked in him. And watch what happens when he appeals to his father. 
Verse 11 of Genesis 43. I love this. And their father Israel said, if it must be so now, then do this. Take of the best fruits in the land in your vessels. Carry it down the man a present, a little balm, a little honey, some spices and myrrh and nuts and almonds. And take double money in your hands. Wait a minute. What is this? This is a new flow. You see, when Judah stepped up and showed the right mentality and he repaired the breach in trust and he was willing to die for his brother, when he was speaking to the best in his father, the best in his father showed up. Something opened up in that patriarch. And he says, hey, take a present with you. Let's have some balm and, and some honey and spice. I thought we were in a famine. I thought they were about to die. He says, take some spices and myrrh. And hey, we've got some nuts over here and almonds. And they're like, dad, what do you got in that tent that we don't know about? And yes, let's take twice as much money. And now he's got money and he doubles the money. And he's giving it to him. And he says, now watch how he speaks faith. Watch how he speaks faith. God bless you watching from Hong Kong. Hallelujah. So glad to have you. That was my first trip in 1985. I went to Hong Kong. It was, it was such a, a great experience for me. And I pray that God's blessings will be in your life in Jesus' name. Uh, sorry, I had to interrupt the flow there for a moment. He said, pre-adventure, it was an oversight. He went from everything is against me to what? It's an oversight. Now, this is what happens. This is what happens when faith starts to move. Is that instead of magnifying, oh my God, I, 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 you've got to get this. You've got to get this. When we are people of faith and we focus on the wrong thing, we amplify the problem. And we say all these things are against us. When we reset our motive, reset our mindset, get into the flow of faith, then all of a sudden, now our faith goes into the other extreme. And he says, you know what? Maybe all of this was just an oversight. Maybe all of this, we've read more into it than we thought. You know what? You know what? Hey, hey, maybe this time everything's going to be better. Everything will be different. You can go and you can have Benjamin. It's going to be great. It's going to be awesome. Take your brother, arise and go. And God Almighty give you mercy before the man. Wow. And he says, look, if I'm bereaved, I'm bereaved, but I'm going to trust. He leans back. What was it? It was because of Judah's leadership. I call him a prophetic connector. He's God's agent of change. What God needs right now is he needs people in between where the church is now and the prophetic beacon that's already in our future, that's already given us a pattern, that already has the keys to the storehouse, those strategically placed people that are already in those positions. God wants to bring us together, but we have to be on the same wavelength. We have to be on the same page. We have to be mature enough to handle it. We have to be, we have to be able to move in the spirit. We have to love each other. We have to stop being so petty, stop being so trite, and be able to say, you know what? We're going to take care of each other. I'm not going without my brother. I'm willing to die for my brother. And this trust gets healed between the elders and between this generation that's coming up, that's taking the charge. There has to be someone that leads that mentality shift. Someone has to lead it, and it's Judah. And Judah means praise. Something about the praisers is that they can anticipate. Something about a praiser is they're the early adopters. Something about the praisers is it unlocks the future. Something about the praiser is they're the first ones there. They're the leaders. And so right now, this is what we do. We praise our way out. This is the reason why David could pull from his genetic tribe, his genetic connection to the, to the history, is that when he was in Ziklag and everything burned down, what happened? A praise came up in him. He encouraged himself in the Lord. This is what we have to do. We have to default we have to default to Judah. We have to default to praise. We have to default to worship. So what are we going to do? We're going to speak faith. We're going to change our mentality. And God is going to make us connectors. We're going to be agents of change. 
We're going to speak to where there's been broken trust and we're going to restore trust. We're going to speak to where there's been a poor mentality of trying to hurt someone else when someone else has been hurt and we're going to break the pattern. We're not going to let it continue. We're hurting people hurt people. No, we're not going to let that happen. We're going to speak life. We're going to speak hope. We're going to echo all of the things that we have heard from the elders before us that spoke faith to us in our time. This is now our time to speak faith for our generation and to stand up and say we're going to live and not die. You stand up in the middle of all of the pressure and you say we're going to live and not die. We are going to come out of this in Jesus name. We praise our way out and we lead others into a new dimension of revelation and understanding. A mindset shift happens for the whole family. And on this trip, the veil is taken off of Joseph. On this trip, he says, go and send the wagons quickly and get my father and everybody come to Egypt. Show them all my glory. On this trip, they get healed. On this trip, the past is overcome. On this trip, it's Judah that's down in front of Joseph saying, no, no, you're going to take me instead of Benjamin. And that's what broke it down. That's what broke the wall down. And that's what caused the test to, to, be, to be passed. Hallelujah. Right now. We're going to praise our way out. Lift your hands to the Lord and give him praise. Father, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, right now that you are our provision, that you are our strength, that you're getting the resources to us where we are. But ultimately, God, you want to move us into a new position. You want to move us, oh God, entirely into a new place. You want us to navigate, oh God, the future. You want us to step, oh God, into something that is global, something that is bigger than us. I praise you, Father, for all of the connectors right now, for all of the praisers, for all the people with the right mentality that are with the body, that are close to the people of God, but have a new mindset. And they can speak to the patriarch. They can speak to those who are the, the controlling voices and controlling hand and the leaders. And we can have a total leadership shift from generation to generation right now. Father, I thank you that it's happening. You're speaking to the elders. The elders are getting a fresh word. I thank you, God, for this generation, oh God, that you have that you have now given the reins to, that they're getting a fresh word. And I thank you, God, it's going to trickle down to our children and to our grandchildren. Oh, God, that we're all going to benefit from this move that's happening. It's massive. It's bigger than what we can even grasp right now. But, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we are thanking you that you do all things well. Even when we don't understand what's going on, even when we're being tested, Father, I thank you, Lord. I worship you, God. I praise you, God. I'm I'm going to speak faith. I'm going to declare the word of the Lord. We are going to live and not die in Jesus' name. Praise God. All right, clap your hands right where you are. Give him praise. Will you do it? Will you just give him some hallelujahs for a minute right now? <laughs> oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, I hope you've been encouraged tonight. I hope you've been blessed tonight. I hope this word has been uh, a strength to your spirit. And I hope you've been able to see how things connect together and what we can do as the body of Christ to pull from the word of God to give strength to us right now. Jesus is the root and the offspring of David. The root and the offspring of David. So that root of Judah was really the power of Christ. It was the divine work of God in the life of Judah that made, made him the root. But no, but Judah wasn't really the root. God is the root. Christ is the root. And the offspring of David, what comes out of David, the root and the offspring of David is Christ. And so we know that he is the son of David. Blessed is the son of David who comes in the name of the Lord. And so when we praise him, we connect to that whole ecosystem of faith, of leadership, and the prophetic. We connect to the future and to all the resources. We connect to the dream. We connect to the revival. We connect to the global outpouring that Jesus died for. You see, Joseph's dream was directly tied to the king's dream. 
Joseph's dream was directly tied to the king's dream. Joseph's dream came to pass when he worked to fulfill the king's dream. And when we live to fulfill the dream that Jesus dreamed on that cross, he shed his blood for every soul to be saved. He shed his blood so that there would not be one person left behind. He's not willing that any should perish. If you perish, it's because you wanted to. But he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So the Lord told me this, and I, I just I keep going back to it. It's one of the recent words that the Lord gave me is he said, you keep worrying about riots and COVID. He said, I'm working on a global revival right now, and I want you to pray for the nations. And so the nations came to Joseph. I believe that God is going to arrange it, where God is going to bring the nations together to the body of Christ. We're going to step out on that stage. He's giving us the resources to make it happen. And so he's got us in the testing stage. He's in the testing moment to see if we can handle the place that he has ultimately designed and prepared for us. I want to make it there. I want to do whatever I've got to do to adjust. I want to do whatever it takes for God to heal me, deliver me, change me, purify me, whatever it takes, because I don't want to miss out on the majesty of this incredible moment of God's end time harvest and revival. Amen. Amen. So as we close today, we're going to pray for our world leaders. Uh, we're going to, we're, we don't have time to name every one of the hundred and was it 90 something nations in the world, but we are going to pray for our leaders. We're going to pray for our world leaders. And uh, I like to just pray just general prayers over the continents. And, uh, and, and then in, in more private time, God may direct us specifically over the nations and speak over different nations if God directs you to a nation that I saw as Hong Kong jumped on, that some of you immediately started praying for Hong Kong, and I think that's amazing. Uh, we can do that for California or Florida. You could do that for Illinois, too. You could say, you know what? God's put another state on my mind, uh, and, and we can pray for that. But we're going to take a few minutes right now. We're going to pray for our leaders, and we're going to pray that God will have the Josephs and the Daniels in position. That God will have the Josephs and the Daniels and the final thing we're going to pray about this, I want you to get this with me. Let's pray that the Mordecais will replace the Hamans. We know that there are some Hamans in high places right now too. So we are going to pray for the Mordecais to change out the Hamans. Okay, let's pray together. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, for every person that you have caused to go through a process Oh God, a process of testing, a process of alone, uh, 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 that happens alone and isolated and, and being rejected. Oh God, as Joseph was. But I thank you, God, for these who didn't fit in the present tense of the church because they were destined, oh God, for the future of the church. I pray that you would put key people in high places. We thank you, God, for Brother Art Wilson, who you've put in the United Nations. We know that he's, an that he's an ambassador, but he's also an apostle. And we thank you, God, for his leadership. We thank you, God, for his mindset. We thank you, Lord, for his faith. We thank you, Lord, for the miracles that have been done around the world. Nations have heard the gospel and been touched. Over two billion people heard the testimony of Lee Stone King because you had, per you had put someone who had been through a great journey Oh, God, who had been rejected and criticized and, 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 and doubted. Oh, God, you took Art Wilson and you put him in the United Nations and put a church there. Father, I thank you for what you have done there. And I speak in Jesus' name that you would continue to put more and more people, put people next to President Trump, put people next to our senators, our congressmen. Oh, God, let the, let the local congressmen, oh, God, have pastors, oh, God, apostolic men and women, oh, God, that they will connect with. Let them connect with prophets and intercessors. And God, I ask you, Lord, in Jesus' name, that you would just position people in high places all around the world. And we are asking you, God, in the name of Jesus, to pull down the Hamans. Oh, God, to cancel the strategies, oh, God, of hell. All of those that are manipulating, all of those who have influence now with the nations, we pray that you would swap them out, oh, God, for someone else. As you used, oh, God, Hushai to confound the, the, the insight of Ahithophel. And as David said, turn the counsel of Ahithophel 
Ahithophel, reversed the counsel of Ahithophel. Oh God, and Hushai took the place of Ahithophel. So Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that you would cause those, Lord Jesus, those that would use their wisdom against the people of God, those that would use their, their, their mental acumen and brilliance against the church. Oh God, pull them down, reverse their strategies, reverse their influence, remove them, and instead put people in their places that will be for the church, that will be for a revival, that will be for your word. God, we are interceding together right now for the people of God around the world, for the underground church that is suffering so much. Give them favor. Oh God, I pray that they would not be discovered, that they would not be found. Oh God, that their churches would be able to operate under the radar. Oh God, that they would continue to grow all across Taiwan and China, oh God, and Hong Kong. Oh God, bless the church. We pray, Lord Jesus, for those that are in remote places like Mongolia and all through the, the different stands, the uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan and Kyrgyzstan and, and, and etc. God, we are praying all through Asia in the name of Jesus, all through all through Cambodia and, and all through oh, Laos and, uh, and all through Vietnam. Lord Jesus, we're in so much trouble. Oh God, we, we know there's so much pressure upon the churches there and their suffering. God, we're just asking you in the name of Jesus uh, that you would help those churches. Uh, oh God, bless them, God, with leaders uh, that will love them. People in the government that will just say, you know what? We don't care. We're not going to persecute you. Even if there's a policy that's anti-church, put someone else in that position, Lord. Give them favor. God, I pray for India and Nepal. We're praying, oh Lord Jesus, uh, all the way, all the way, oh God, all the way through the Middle East, through Yemen, oh God, through Syria, through Turkey. Oh God, we're asking you, God, in Saudi Arabia, in Iran and Iraq. Oh God, all through Israel. God, we are praying for neighbors. Oh God, neighbors, Lord Jesus, to get along with each other and that somehow the civil war would stop long enough for there to be a true outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We are praying for leaders to be raised up, godly men and godly women that you will put in high places that will be, that will be prophetic beacons for the church in Jesus' name. We pray, oh God, for Africa, for North Africa, for Central Africa and South Africa, for West Africa and East Africa. Oh God, leaders in high places. Leaders, oh God, that will be raised up to help. Oh God, that you will give resources to, that you will give great influence to and power to in the name of Jesus for South America. Right now we need revival and help in South America. Oh God, in Central America, Lord, we are praying in Jesus' name in Mexico and United States and Canada, in North America, Lord, we are praying. Right now, we are asking you, God, for every mayor. Oh, God, for every chief of police. Oh, God, for every judge. Oh, God, for every every governor, that there would be godly men and godly women that will be there. We're praying, God, for peace. We're praying, oh, God, for revival. And Lord, we repent. We repent for our nation, and we ask you to forgive us, oh, God. Cleanse us, oh, God. Change our hearts and change our minds and help the church, Lord, to change its thinking. Help us, oh God, to make the shift. Help us, oh God, to have leaders, connectors, oh God, great men like Judah. Oh God, that will have a new mindset and bring that new mindset into the church. Oh God, so that we can, we can as a movement, come onto that stage and be trustworthy. That we can come on that stage and show them what love looks like. That we can come on that stage and, look like, and show them what reconciliation looks like and healing looks like and forgiveness looks like. Oh God, that we can show them what it what, what it means, what it means to be unified, oh God, that the church can show that, oh God, to this broken world. We ask you, Lord, tonight in Jesus' name for every intercessor that's joining with us, for every person praying with us right now, for those that will watch later. Oh God, we ask also for them right now that your spirit would just be poured out and that you would refresh every person that's listening to me right now. Let them feel your love. Let them feel your strength right now. Let them feel hope, oh God, in their hearts. Supply the needs. Release the finances, God, in Jesus' name. But most importantly, let us feel the access to your spirit. Because when we have faith surging through us, then anything is possible. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. You are amazing people. You really are. You are incredible people. I love you. It is such a joy to connect with you. Thank you for, for just being with us as we pray here at the Church Triumphant. It's beautiful, and uh, it's a wonderful thing, and we can do a lot together. 
I ask you to pray for me that God will give me clear direction and that, will, that God will help me to know uh, what, his main, what the next big focus is for us. We're working on some exciting things for next week. We want to do a few different things for the church. Uh, we may share them with everyone on Facebook on our platform here. Um, we're talking about uh, interviewing some people and us sharing and talking together in a forum. It's going to be really amazing. Tomorrow's going to be another great day. It's always great to be uh, to be back, and I hope that the uh, the picture and the sound is better. Uh, when I was on uh, on my respite, it wasn't the best. Uh, uh, when I looked at it yesterday, my lighting was so bad; it was horrible. <laughs> but hopefully, hopefully everything's better with us today. We love you. God bless you. I just feel so much thankfulness for you today. We're going to get through this, and it's going to be amazing. The glory of God is coming upon us in Jesus' name. God bless you.